This is a short video just to give you a summary of two-way analysis of variance. <clears throat> I presented a short video on doing a one-way ANOVA. I just want to use this opportunity to sort of discuss uh, the difference between the two. If you have a good grasp of uh, one-way ANOVA, you should be able to handle two-way ANOVA without too much difficulty. Um, essentially, we are trying to, uh, again, find out to what extent that there is a factor that's affecting a set of results. So say, if we go back to the same problem that we looked at, we wanted to find out whether or not the mean ages of the, in the employees in the plants differed. However, we could create a very special design that allow us to isolate other factors that might be influencing the data or the, the results that we're seeing. We want to do some isolation. So what do we do? is essentially do what we call a repeated measures um, test. Or we would take the same individuals and actually get repeated measures from them. Now that particular example I did in the one way and over does not actually lend itself to that. What um, could lend itself to this particular situation would be a case where, for example, uh, in class we discuss students um, being recruited for a set of videos and we had created a randomized design where a group of students was actually asked to watch a specific video and we had four groups of students each of them watching a different video and then at the end of that determining the likelihood of actually coming to the institution if we actually allow the same individual to watch all four videos then in that case we get repeated measures all right and if we do that, then one thing we control for is any variation among the individuals who are actually watching the videos. Because in the randomized design, we cannot control for that because the, the, the samples are totally independent of each other. But in this case, when we use repeated measures or dependent samples, we are able to control for any variation that is actually caused by the individuals themselves. And so therefore, the test becomes a little more sensitive. So what are the assumptions? The assumptions are quite similar to the assumptions for one way ANOVA. And um, we assume that the populations are normal. We assume that the variances are equal, that the observations within each of the samples are independent of each other, and that we are either working with ratio data or interval data. All right. Uh, we see here that one of the ways in which we could look at this um, particular problem is testing five routes to a destination for three different cab companies. So the cab companies, we may want to determine to what extent there's a difference between the cab companies. And what we will do is use five routes. So again, if we standardize the routes, we'll take route one to five, and then we'll have each cab company drive route one. Each of them will drive, um, sorry, each of them will drive route uh, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so that way we get each route would have three different um, um, values that we obtain and hence the experiment is actually repeated, repeated measures. So route 1 was driven by cab company 1, route 1 was also driven by cab company 2 and 3 and so forth. Alright? So having said that, what happens now in this case, when we are doing the analysis of variance, we will take what was the sum of the variation within the samples and break that down even further. We want to break it down because now we've, we're using the same individuals to provide repeated measures. We're controlling for variation among the uh, either the students who are watching the videos or the routes that are being used to. Um, sort of get a measure of how long each cab company will actually take to do the route, then what happens is that we want to control for that variation, and we represent that variation now by an additional value which we call the sum of squares due to the blocks. So when we look at the design of our problem, we have groups, blocks, and what's left, what is unexplained, we'll just call it the error the error term, or error variation, okay? So our total variation is made up of now three parts. The variation due to the groups, variation due to the blocks, which happens to be the rows, 
and the variation that is unexplained. We will calculate now each of these um, terms. Now, for one way or another, we could use the same formula for calculating SST, which we've done before. We could actually use the same formula for SSB, although that we use a, a, a sort of slightly different formula, but there's a formula that's given to us in our text that we can use. And here's a formula for SSBL. So we've calc in calculating SSBL, one of the things that we, we do for the blocks is that we will actually calculate the overall average. All right. And then subtract that from each of the block means squared and then multiply by the size of that block. Well, the size of the block is just really the number of groups that you have. So each row, the sample size for each row is the number of groups that you have. All right. And so we will calculate SSBL in this fashion where we weight the difference between the grand mean and the row mean by the sample size. If we add up all of those, then we will get the sum of uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the sum of squares or the variation due to the blocks. Similarly, we will calculate the variation due to the groups. The formula is similar. But instead of using the rows, we're going to now use the columns, all right? And then you recall that we had a formula already for SST. So now, how do we calculate SSE? SSE is a strange-looking formula. So rather than using the formula, we could actually calculate it by using the subtraction right here. SST minus SSB plus SSBL will give us SSE. I need to, I should just change that. This should be SSE. Okay. The formulas are quite similar. You remember that the mean square is basically the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. So when we're looking at the blocks, the degrees of freedom for the blocks, we have B blocks, which is the basically B represents the number of rows. B, B minus 1. We have K groups, the number of columns, which, which would be K minus 1. That's the degrees of freedom. And then the product of k minus 1 times b minus 1 will give us the um, degrees of freedom associated with the error. And so for each of those formulas, we can calculate the mean square quite easily, which is basically sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. And then we put the table all together. So one way and over to two way and over, all we have to do is this additional calculation for the sum of squares for the blocks. That's all. One additional calculation. So it looks a little crazy when you're doing the calculations, but it's just a single extra calculation. So we shouldn't get too hung up on it. S sources of variation, the sum of squares, the degrees of freedom, the MS values, and the F ratio. And so we could calculate the sum of squares due to blocks, sum of squares due to the groups between the samples, and then the sum of squares that really has to do with the error. And um, we could edit those. There we go. So just want to be consistent here. Okay. So we are good to go. All right, so SSE is just the SSC we've already calculated. So MSE is SSC divided by this. So we just take all of these values. And now we can calculate the F statistic associated with the blocks, which is MSBF. We can call it FBL, which is equal to MSBL of MSE. And then the F statistic associated with the groups, MSB of MSE. Now, we are really just interested in this uh, right here. We're really just interested in, in this part, statistic because we want to find there's a difference between the group means. But if we were interested in whether or not there was a difference between the block means, we certainly can look at this statistic right here. But when we are calculating the critical value, we have to use the right combination of degrees of freedom. So the numerator degrees of freedom would be B minus 1, 
and the denominator degrees of freedom would be k minus 1 a to b minus 1. In this case right here, when we're looking at an S statistic for the groups, the degree, numerator degrees of freedom would be k minus 1, and that is the denominator degrees of freedom. So we just have to make sure that we select the right combination so that we get the appropriate critical value. Okay? So in a nutshell, once you, once you complete that, the five steps are still the same for hypothesis testing, and we just need to do the appropriate calculation and answer the question. All right? I'll do a demonstration um, in another video, in a subsequent video, on how to solve this problem using Excel.